we may have hoped. Ah, fair enough. Uh, that this family could have already been strongly associated with xeric or dry habitats, so they weren't as uh, represented in Australia. It's Matthews 2000. Right? Um, and there are, for some in tropics, uh, particularly Epitrogyne seems to do very well in uh, the neotropics, but most are these flightless desert taxa, right, with soil dwelling larva, uh, lots of flightless tribes, you know, even though some are flighted. And these are just a couple of African species, so that this slide was not devoid of pictures. So, okay. So we've been working a lot of us, uh, Kojin, Rolf, Lubosh, myself, Martini, uh, on building up a phylogeny for this whole group. Uh, so here is our most recent tree, but condensed down just to the tribal level. Uh, so there are 38 tribes worldwide in Pomeliani, uh, only 12 in North America. And we're going to walk through some of these clades based on the 31 tribes we have represented, which includes all the North American ones. Uh, and this is a preliminary tree. Uh, so my students and I and uh, the rest of our collaborators have been working on it, but we haven't gotten the final analysis done. Uh, but this is really very well supported. So good enough for walking through. And I've divided them into clades one, two, and three. Uh, and of course, we're going to start backwards with clade three, because what you'll notice, here's Pomeliani, all this, there's a little bunch of our outgroups from six other subfamilies, and then we have a Pomeliani group three. And here's what it looks like. So, so here's almost 400 species of Pomeliines in clades one and two, all of these outgroups. Here's Zolodyne, uh, that other Pomeliod uh, branch subfamily. And then here's a clade of four tribes uh, that are actually falling out and making Pomeliine polyphyletic, which kind of makes sense because these are the ones with that at least some individuals have open procox cavities. Uh, there's Pemeliani with its non-inverted agus and the membranes exposed. Uh, this is the weakest supported part of the tree, but it's only because of what the specific branching pattern is with these. They always come out separate from the rest of Pemeliani. And in the case of North America, uh, we only have Nemo uh, represented. And Nemo Platini is uh, worldwide, uh, but fairly well revised recently. There's uh, this Albu et al. paper that looked at the Laudis and several others that have come out. Uh, in North America, we only have two genera, 11 species. Uh, they're all pretty small. In the case of Laudis, like two millimeters or less down there. Uh, the antenna is shorter than the width of the head, two segmented club. Uh, four tibia expanded, uh, the mandible with a reduced mola. And in some cases, like Alaudis, the ovipositor is actually completely reduced to a gonopore. Uh, and Alaudis are mamecophiles uh, living in ant nests. So there's some thought that maybe they just don't need to oviposit anywhere in particular because they do it inside of an ant nest. So here are our two genera, Nemopladia and Alaudis. You see the nice scaly pretty things, and you can see these expanded four tibia. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about for the what might be considered true Pomeliani, but there's still some work to do. Everything else, the vast majority of what's in the subfamily, falls into these clades one and two, which are monophyletic together. Right. And we'll go with clade one at the top here first. So the purple arrows are representing taxa that are in North America. Right. And in this case, it's kind of neat because there's this mix throughout the tree of South American, African, and uh, 
northwest or northwestern southwestern U.S. species. Uh, but like this clade, so Cypidines and Adelostomines are actually um, sub uh, sub-Saharan African and Paleoarctic a little bit. Uh, and then Alanophorus is a single species that occurs in Argentina and uh, southern South America. But then here are Anepsiines, which are endemic to uh, the southwestern U.S. and some of Mexico. Uh, the Croanines, I kept them separate. Uh, I'll talk about them in a second because they're not monophyletic either. Uh, Cryptoglossines, Nyctophorines. Uh, we have this group of acidines where the North American ones come out as a group, but the tribe itself is worldwide. Uh, and then coniontines. And coniontines have a problem where this brinkine, uh, the brinkines are inside of the larger group uh, within this tree. And this is the first time we've had enough sampling to see this. And then a clade of Southern South American taxa, uh, stemocines, which are also in the US. And then one anepsiine that I want to point out because it's the same coma. And it's in anepsiine, but here's the rest of anepsiine way up here. So starting with anepsiine, they're small, flightless, uh, monophyletic, except for this included ancoma. Uh, predominantly found in sand dunes, uh, under rocks, uh, and most of the records we have are from pitfalls. I find them occasionally at night on dunes. You'll see them walking around, but pitfalls seem to be the best. Uh, five genera, if you include ancoma. Uh, again, two to six millimeters, fairly small. Uh, the eyes are completely divided, uh, and they're flightless. Uh, flightlessness tends to have this syndrome where the Humera of the elytra get rounded because uh, they don't have flight muscles there. Uh, Mentum moderate in size. Uh, and then these protibia are apically expanded uh, versus one of a few other groups that have divided eyes in North America. Uh, and Duyan uh, defined the tribe, the keys uh, for everything except Ancoma, which he included in later work. So here they are in all of their beautiful tiny glory. And you can kind of see here that the epistoma is dividing the eye. You can only see the top half, not the bottom. And you can see these expanded uh, protivia. Right? Okay. And then we have ancoma. So ancoma uh, is a myrmecophile, which you dance. Uh, has quite different antennae. It doesn't have those expanded uh, protibia and in fact comes out outside of the nepsiine uh, and needs to be dealt with soon. Uh, but this is, I believe, only in California. I don't think, there, I don't think they occur, or I don't think there are any records outside of California. Okay, so the next one, the coniontiny. Right. Also a large, in this case, a large tribe of flightless beetles, uh, often associated with sandy habitats. Uh, some of them are known to do substrate tapping, uh, where we think it's a male-female call to find each other. Uh, four genera, so some like Eusatis, I think are very well known. Uh, all flightless, all fairly stout. Uh, the ovipositor with the gonostyle is pretty rudimentary or absent. Uh, mentum, the face of the mouth parts, not concealing the maxilla. Uh, and the antennal segments gradually enlarge, not forming a club. So there's uh, actually good work on this uh, down to species for everything except coniontis. Uh, coniontis, Kojin could talk about if he wants. It's a, a really interesting group, but difficult below the genus level. So here they are, uh, Eusatis. Is one of the iconic species of the Southwest. Uh, Celis, which is a coastal dune species, Conosatus, and then Coniontis, which is all over the Southwest. And the one problem here is that we're finding the tribe Branchinines, uh, Branchini, uh, sitting partially within the Coniontines. This tribe has three genera. They're 
pretty rare. Uh, even the species uh, like uh, Brancus whitehead eye in uh, Texas is very rarely collected. Uh, they appear pretty close to coniontides. Uh, they've primarily been separated by having more of a clavate or three segmented antennal club, which you can kind of see in this picture. Uh, and the presence of scaled CD, which really only applies to Brancus. Uh, it doesn't apply to Oxanthes. And Warren Steiner, who's here, has worked on this group, uh, particularly in the Bahamas and the West Indies, uh, describing new species. But there are a lot of new Brancus in Mexico and down through Central America uh, that Warren, I hope, will get to soon. Okay. So cryptoglossiny, uh, you'll probably are familiar with the blue death veining beetle, uh, Zbolus varicosus. So that's it within this tribe, cryptoglossiny. They're really pretty hard bodied beetles uh, and they live in some of the driest, hottest desert conditions we have. Uh, a few are also uh, partially in caves, like Spazillus. Uh, and this again includes the blue death veining beetle, where when they're harassed, they're known for kind of thanatizing, just locking up. Um, and yeah, you know, they don't have defensive glands. Remember, none of these groups do. So your options for not getting eaten involve things like being super hard, uh, like so hard that you break things' teeth when they try to eat you, or hiding really well, or uh, playing dead. Right? So cryptoglossines, large beetles, uh, labrum nearly completely uh, hidden in clypeus, uh, eyes strongly constricted by the epistomal canthus, and in one case, sexually divided. Uh, and then the maxilla not concealed by the mentum. And Rolf Albu, who's here, uh, did a full tribal revision for this group. So we have keys to all the species and subspecies that are reasonably easy to use. Okay, and here's some pictures for fun. So again, the blue death in the middle. I think they've become far more common because they've been used in outreach a lot and you can buy them online. You know? Okay, uh, closely related sister tribe, uh, the Nictiparini. This is a monophyletic tribe with a single genus uh, in California. Uh, and they're also flightless, but unlike a lot of the cryptoglossines, they're very roughly sculptured. The tarsi have this dense yellow CD underneath, which is a little bit like the uh, uh, nodalanine we just looked at, the Silochnemus, but very different in gestalt. Uh, the head is elongate with this median keel. Uh, in this case, the cardo and stipes are exposed. Uh, and I left out a lot of the uh, female internal tract characters because they get very complicated very quick. Uh, but in this case, these spermatheca are serial, serially arranged. And I put in a link to uh, this Polarancus and Caterino paper. That was a really nice phylogeography, uh, mostly looking at Nicticorus carnatus, but finding that there were divisions within the transverse range of uh, the California mountains. Um, and there's some questions as to where the species boundaries within these four species are. So it's a group that could, could use some looking at. Okay, and here's one. So they're, they're pretty distinctive in terms of their rugosity and this median keel on the head. And you can see like the cryptoglossines, uh, you get the labrum mostly concealed. Okay, so similar stenocyne. Uh, this, again, appears to be monophyletic. Um, we've only got two taxa in the tree, but it's a fairly well-known group uh, with a worldwide distribution, uh, excluding Australia and Oceania. Uh, plenty of them are considered myrmecophiles, so a lot of them we just don't know if they're associated with ants or not. Uh, four genera in North America, uh, they're small. The eyes are fully divided, like the NFC eyes but the protibia are not expanded at the base. Uh, and you see the lower group of facets versus the upper. Uh, Mentum small. And Albu et al. Uh, made a worldwide key uh, to the, the whole tribe. Uh, and then uh, Albu and Andrew uh, revised Deflosicus. 
uh, papyrvised areoshysis, which is by far the most species rich genus we have. In fact, I think there are only two genera. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in areoshysis. Uh, and that's a, again, a really neat southwestern Myrmecophilus uh, genus. And here's a picture. So there's areoshysis. And you can see, to me, this looks an awful lot like uh, Ancoma, but uh, it's not. It just looks similar. And there's Tapulosicus. So. And here you can see the dorsal part of the eye has more facets than the ventral part. OK. So Macroni, where we have two uh, genera in North America. Uh, they didn't come out as monophyletic. They came out on a grade with each other in our phylogeny. Uh, however, there are also two species that are in Australia or Australasian region uh, that we strongly suspect that that is not a monophyletic group with those either, uh, but we just don't know yet. Uh, uncommonly collected in some cases. Uh, every once in a while, you'll hit on a good knife and they just come in. They're flighted. So they don't have the abdominal membranes. And this is uh, one of the first groups that we're looking at with flight wings. Uh, elongate body, uh, mentum covering the maxilla. Um, Procoxal cavity is internally open, mandible slender, et cetera. Uh, Spillman gave a good key for Eusophilus, uh, but there is not a good key for Alephus. Um, and here they are, and they're, they're a little bit standard beetle and standard tineve looking kind of things. But again, the lack of those abdominal uh, exposed abdominal membranes helps put it towards pomelians. And from there, it's pretty straightforward. OK. So the next group, the acidine, uh, is actually the group I did my dissertation on and I'm endlessly fiddling with. Uh, they're a monophyletic tribe, but Unlike these others, that some of which are endemic, this group is in North America, South America, Southern Africa, Palearctic, and Madagascar. So they're all over the place, but each one of those areas appears to be its own monophyletic group with its own genera and such. Uh, in the US, there are 10 genera, approximately 250 species. And you can see here on the antenna that this last segment is reduced and usually partially amplected into the tent. Uh, the ovipositor is really long, as long as the abdominal cavity, uh, and heavily sclerotized. And the mentum uh, completely fills the buccal cavity and conceals the uh, cardo and stipes. Uh, one of the neater groups, Stenomorpha, uh, looks an awful lot like that Coelacnemus we just looked at, and Heliodes. Uh, and they appear to be um, Batesian mimics of Eliodes for the most part. They'll even do the head standing, the whole business, but they lack the chemical defenses. Uh, so I have a paper looking at the tribes, but, or sorry, looking at the genera within North America, uh, but most of those genera still need revision at the species level, at least Stenomorpha and Pelociferous and Pelorophus do, the big ones. Okay, so some general pictures. Again, here's Stenomorpha. Uh, looks an awful lot like Eliodes, head stands, the whole thing, but lacking those defensive glands and without the abdominal membranes exposed. Uh, and some of the others are quite small and cute. So, and all of them share those antennal characters and a very large one of them. Okay. So plague two, the last one, uh, only contains a couple of things that are in North America. Uh, so you can see like down here, this entire bottom half is old world uh, African Palearctic. Uh, the base of this group is uh, Southern African. And then up here, this is where we get uh, North American and South American taxa. So we have Nemodinus, which is a North American endemic. Uh, and then we have this mix of things from South America that are in uh, unique South American tribes or within a Drotiny or Epitrigyny. 
uh, some of those simply fall out, whereas all the North American grotines come out together, all the North American and all but one South American epitragines come out together. And I think these are probably the two biggest tribes that you find at intersections because uh, they're, they're very uh, species rich. So Nemodinus, uh, Nemodini, is a single genus with three species uh, that I believe uh, Warren Steiner has been working on. Uh, and they're endemic to the Southwest, uh, Arizona, California, Utah. I'm pretty sure they're Nevada records, but didn't make it into the catalog. Um, the Crotibia has this single apical spur and the Crotibia are greatly expanded and also have this submedial tooth, which is a very weird character for pomelions. Uh, the mandibles are externally grooved throughout uh, and the appendages are really long uh, and they do fly, sorry, fly through. So, okay, the last ones, uh, the Adrotiny. And this is where, again, you know, when it comes to Taneeb identifications, the Adrotiny, Epitragyny boundary is difficult, right? So again, most of the New World taxa all monophyletic, except for some South American groups. Um, and Thomas Casey really worked through this and described a ton of genera and species, all of which need critical examination. Uh, one of the course helpers here, Chris Worth, is revising this group. Uh, has found a lot of questionable things and, and new things, lots of new species. Um, so generally identifiable to genus, uh, using American beetles, uh, species can be a whole other question. So the mentum, generally hexagonal, large covering the cardo and stipes, the maxill maxillary segments, uh, generally a marginate apically, uh, mesococcal cavities closed by sternites, antenna filiform due to the serrate clavate. Uh, unlike the acidines, that segment 11 is approximately sub equal to 10. And this group includes both flighted and flightless taxa, which also makes for a lot of morphological variation in them. So here are some of our groups. Some are better known, like Adrodes, which obviously is a flightless taxa. Uh, Shadamoxis, which includes cave dwelling species. Uh, and then we get things like Chilometapon uh, that are a little bit more standard beetle looking, right? They're certainly harder to tell by gestalt, but that mental character and the lack of abdominal membranes uh, can at least get you to Edrotine. So, so last one, Epitragyne, uh, awfully similar. Uh, they're kind of inverted, whereas a lot of adrotines are flightless and some are flighted. Epitragines are predominantly flighted with some flightless. Okay. Uh, and this group ranges from the tropics and the desert. So there are plenty of tropical species. Uh, you can get them by sweeping, which is not a common way to get from melions. Uh, and again, one of the most common interceptions, one that I've been asked to identify multiple times. Uh, 16 genera. The mentum is large, uh, but more transversely trapezoidal or pentagonal versus the adrotines. Uh, and this whole group was uh, revised by a guy named Freude uh, in German. Uh, so if your German is good, you can work through this, uh, but it includes many subspecies that make uh, worldwide identification difficult. So that is, I think, yeah, one more, just to show some uh, epitragyne diversity. So Bothrodes, I think, is probably the most common North American collected species. Uh, they actually occur out here to the east. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I'll leave off. And, uh, thank you. So, so stop sharing. OK. Am I supposed to check for questions in the... Yeah, well, does anyone have questions they want to ask over Zoom or... Looks like there's some stuff on the slide. Yeah, I have, I have a question that I put on the... Uh, this is Jason. 
Um, I have a question that I put on the Slack, but I can go ahead and mention it here. Okay. That's all right. Um, so there's a couplet in the American Beatles key under the Pimeliani key two, which I've always found kind of troublesome. Uh, that's couplet four, where it says the eighth and tenemir enlarged much larger than the tenth or seventh. And that's to the is that just incorrect? Is it, should it just be the 10th and the 11th that we're yeah, comparing? So, so acidines come out twice in that key, um, which is a little difficult, but the um, we're, we're actually making a new version of the American Beatles key for 2022. Um, and one of the things to correct is that. Yeah, so the 11th antinomir is much smaller than the 10th and generally amplected or um, sucked into it partially, uh, and that character along with the mentone generally work best because uh, the, the seventh doesn't hold up for everything in uh, Mexico, for example, which is the problem. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. And I think just an important note to add for distinguishing epitragines from Edrotines is um, C. Doyen, uh, Doyen's 1994 paper with some good internal characters, uh, particularly when you get down into the uh, taxa that occur in sort of, if, if you're dealing with uh, intercepts from uh, Northern South America, there are some really sort of small, um, odd derived uh, epitragines that you should dissect and look at the um, uh, internal characters if you have a female specimen and uh, see Doyen for those characters, because um, there's some yeah. good epitragine. Yeah, and there's, I should say, there are a lot of good internal characters for these groups, but I wanted to uh, just focus on the external morphology to the extent possible. But, but yeah, there, there are ones where it's like, oh, just check the female ovipositor or check the female internal tract, but if you have a male, you're, you're out of luck in that case, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you.